Welcome back to the Hardware Unboxing News Corner. We are back from Computex. Hopefully you've already caught up with Steve's unboxing boxes episode yesterday. And today we're back into the usual schedule of News Corner. You'll also notice the set behind me is pretty much back to normal. If you want to see the behind the scenes process to getting that all done, check out our Boxing Boxes series exclusive to our Patreon members. Even though Computex has just happened where we saw a ton of announcements, there has still been some interesting news stories to emerge this week, including a ton of AMD related stuff. So let's get into it. As part of Apple's quite funny cheese grater presentation at WWDC earlier this week, where we got such gems as a $1,000 monitor stand, AMD announced new professional grade graphics cards in the form of the Radeon Pro Vega 2 and Radeon Pro Vega 2 Duo. As we've said countless times, we don't really cover professional GPUs all that much, but this launch does have something a bit special about it. We'll start with the Pro Vega 2 though. As expected, we're getting a 7 nanometer Vega 20 GPU inside, but unlike with the consumer focused Radeon 7, the Pro Vega 2 delivers a fully unlocked GPU with 4096 stream processors clocked at 1720 megahertz, providing around 14.1 teraflops of compute performance, higher than the 13.4 teraflops you get with the Radeon 7. Also of importance to creators is the increase in HBM2 VRAM from 16 gigabytes to 32 gigabytes, which makes it a bit of a beast for some professional workloads. Of greater interest is the Pro Vega 2 Duo, which is the first dual GPU graphics card from AMD in quite some time. It's basically two Pro Vega 2 GPUs on the one board, with an Infinity Fabric link between the two, providing 84 gigabytes per second data transfers for better interoperability and memory access. With the same stream processor count and the same boost clock as the Pro Vega 2, the Duo delivers up to 28.2 teraflops of performance from a single board. The board itself does look a little strange. AMD has included a standard PCIe 16x slot, but in addition to that is an all new PCIe connector that supports up to 475 watts of power delivery. This means there is no external power connector on the board, it all runs through the motherboard. An interesting solution that no doubt is all about Apple's proprietary internal design for the Mac Pro. While the single GPU version of this card should be available to the general public at some point, the Radeon Pro Vega 2 Duo is exclusive to the Mac Pro. AMD and Apple have worked together closely for many years now on projects like this, and with Apple placing a big emphasis on compactness and sleek form factors, it's not too surprising the company is still on board with dual GPU graphics cards. If AMD did offer this card to others, it probably would sell, I guess, a few units here and there, but among system builders, dual GPU cards are well out of favor. How much will it cost to buy a Vega 2 Duo? Well, that's still unclear. The Mac Pro starts at a whopping $6,000 US dollars, but you're not getting a dual GPU solution at that price. It's even hard to guess what price sounds right. $20,000? $30,000? I really don't know. What I do know is some Mac Pro configurations even come with four GPUs, so likely two of these Vega 2 Duo cards. So that's some pretty serious compute capabilities. In another interesting partnership, AMD will be licensing out some Radeon GPU IP to Samsung for use in their mobile GPUs. AMD's press release on the matter specifically references licensing custom graphics IP based on the recently announced highly scalable RDNA graphics architecture. Samsung will of course pay license fees and royalties for the privilege. As an Antec notes, Samsung has been working on their own mobile GPU for around seven years now, and that GPU has only featured in test chips. Samsung's own Exynos CPUs have typically used third-party GPUs, but this new deal could signify the start of Samsung using an RDNA-based GPU, or at least a partially RDNA GPU for their mobile chips. Knowing how long it takes to develop a GPU, it's unclear how long Samsung has been working with AMD to utilize RDNA or how long it'll take for that tech to come into their actual GPU products. It's also possible that Samsung is merely licensing IP so that their own GPU tech is not going to get them in patent trouble with AMD. It's an interesting deal and I'll be curiously following how and where RDNA makes the transition to smartphone class SoCs. This last AMD story is a bit of a brief one and a note to those who have followed our 
Computex coverage over the last few weeks. For our Q&A series, we did get a few questions from you guys asking about PCIe 4.0 backporting to older AM4 motherboards like X470. At the time, we had heard that Gigabyte were claiming their older boards would be updated to support PCIe 4.0, but we cut that question and answer at the last minute due to new information. That new information comes directly from AMD, who say that no older AM4 motherboards will support PCIe 4.0. The only boards with support will be X570 at this stage. X470, B450, X370, and so on will only support up to PCIe 3.0. PCIe 4.0 uses the same wiring design as PCIe 3.0, but has stricter signaling requirements. It is theoretically possible that a well-designed X470 board could simply be updated to support PCIe 4.0, while crappier X470 boards may not be good enough to support the tech. It sounds that AMD doesn't want to risk any confusion between boards that can support it and those that can't, so it's requiring motherboard manufacturers to keep their older boards on PCIe 3.0. This means that while Gigabyte does have an early BIOS allowing PCIe 4.0 support on some non-X570 products, that feature will be rolled back and disabled in final BIOS revisions for Ryzen 3000 CPUs. If you want PCIe 4.0, you'll need to purchase an X570 motherboard. Microsoft has added better variable refresh rate support to Windows 10 in the latest version rolling out to users now version 1903. This support comes in the form of a toggle in the graphics setting menu. Under the variable refresh rate header, you can choose to optimize games for variable refresh rate. While this option does sound somewhat interesting, the reality is this toggle is largely just for Microsoft Store titles. One of the things Microsoft kind of stuffed up with the universal Windows platform for gamers, among other things, was not supporting adaptive sync technologies to begin with. And when they did introduce it, game developers needed to specifically enable the tech in their titles. This switch basically overrides the developer switch and allows variable refresh rate support in all UWP games. It doesn't really affect anything else because games released outside of the Microsoft Store have always supported variable refresh rate technology without any significant issues. So if you do see the toggle appear in the settings after an update, well, now you know what it does. And Nantech are reporting that Intel's CPU product line is set to become even more confusing later this year. We already know the company will be shipping 10 nanometer Ice Lake CPUs at TDPs between 9 and 28 watts, so your typical U series range. But joining them will allegedly be another U series lineup built on 14 nanometer process tech codenamed Comet Lake. And Nantech heard about this new line when speaking to a partner about mini PCs. This unnamed partner is planning to upgrade their U series powered mini PCs to Comet Lake later this year in November. The partner clarified these would be 15 watt parts used and specifically Comet Lake, not Ice Lake or another line. The possible plan here, and I'm just speculating here, is to offer Ice Lake at the high end for ultra portables and similar premium systems, then Comet Lake for more mid range and entry level devices. However, Intel really aren't talking much about specific 10th gen SKUs at this point, so we'll have to wait until later in the year to find out more. E3 is kicking off next week where we are set to hear a whole lot about new games, potentially new consoles, and of course the most interesting thing for us, new AMD CPUs and GPUs. A lot of game news has emerged over the last few days, but I did want to highlight something that might be of interest to you guys, and that's the fact that Destiny 2 is coming to Steam and will be available as a free-to-play title. The free version, which will be rebranded as Destiny 2 New Light, comes with all year one content. If you want to access any of the expansions beyond that, of course, you'll have to fork over some cash. As well as the move to Steam, we'll also be getting cross saves for all console platforms, including Xbox, PS4, and Stadia. And there's also a standalone expansion coming later this year called Shadow Keep. So pretty interesting things happening on the Destiny 2 front there. Final topic I wanted to cover is Google Stadia. Not something normally in our wheelhouse, but just wanted to run through the details and get your opinion on it. Pretty interested what our PC gaming community thinks of this one. So Stadia is Google's new streaming platform or game streaming platform. It is coming to 14 regions in November with 31 day one titles, including Ubisoft games like The Division 2 and Ghost Recon Breakpoint, 2K's upcoming Borderlands 3 and Deep Silver's Metro Exodus. Unfortunately, Australia is isn't a supported region at launch, but you guys in the US will get to enjoy it if you do live there. But the pricing structure seems a bit strange. You'll need to fork over $129 for a Stadia controller 
and Chromecast Ultra bundle to begin with. From there, you can either opt to be a pro subscriber, which costs $10 a month and gives access to 4K 60fps HDR streams, or you can remain a free subscriber for 1080p 60fps gaming. But the subscription does not come with any games. Instead, you'll need to buy games just like with any other console. So it's not providing a Netflix-like service like I think some people were expecting and hoping for. The initial $129 bundle, though, does include a copy of Destiny 2 and three months of Stadia Pro. In terms of internet connections, you'll need 35 megabits per second for 4K, around 20 megabits for 1080p, and 10 megabits for 720p. And if you're stuck with a slower connection than that, you won't get 60 FPS. Having tried game streaming services and being universally unimpressed with what they offer compared to PC gaming or even consoles, Stadia doesn't sound all that revolutionary to me. You still have to buy games, you still have to fork out money up front, and if you want the top quality, which on paper should be better than some in-home consoles, you'll also need a subscription. There's also not much exclusive content and the game selection at launch is limited, so I'm not really sure what the hook is here that will get people invested or interested. Definitely want to get your thoughts on it, chuck them in the comments below whether you're interested in Stadia and are planning on checking it out. Anyway, that's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe to get this segment in your inbox every Friday or thereabouts. Stay tuned for more AMD announcements early next week as E3 kicks off, plus some other good stuff that is on the way. Consider supporting us on Patreon. We always really appreciate your guys' support, and I'll catch you in the next one. <laughs>